Well, welcome everyone to lecture nine in our course, Paradise Lost in Slow Motion, hosted by the Antrim Literature Project, a public humanities platform that makes the study of literature accessible to readers beyond the paywalls of the university. Tonight, we have the pleasure of hearing from our guest speaker, Dr. Kat Leckie. Kat Leckie is the CERTS professor in English at Loyola University, Chicago. Her research explores what made common knowledge in the early modern period. Her first book, Pocket Maps and Public Poetry in Renaissance England, published by Oxford University Press in 2019, shows the geographical imaginary fueling the everyday practices of building the English Commonwealth. Her second book project, England's Weedy Renaissance, demonstrates how authors of all stripes turned to uncultivated plants to fashion a native English character. She has also published essays on naturalization, the early modern politics of universal health care, and vegetable virtue ethics. Her work has earned fellowships from the ACLS and the Mellon Foundation, the National Endowment for the Humanities, the, Re the Institute for Research in the Humanities, the Renaissance Society of Shakespeare, and the Folger Shakespeare, Huntington, and Newberry Libraries. So with much thanks for being here, Dr. Lecky, I turn the lecture over to you. Thank you. Um, so before the rest of you were led into this room, I asked Adam if I can do a bit of an experiment um, because I have a 30 minute talk. And as I said, it went over just fine at Yale uh, among Miltonists. And I have a couple of others, right? Um, because I've been writing on this for a long time, but I wanted to start with you because you are the stalwarts from what I understand. And so you are here for it. And so, what about book nine, um, and in particular, maybe, um, what moment at book nine stands out to you? What do you really like, you know, like, what do you feel like as you're reading through these passages? Is there a passage that just gets you? Yeah, Nick. Yeah, so... um. I think the most arresting moment to me in it was the uh, speech given by Eve after she's first eaten the fruit, uh, because she's got some sentiments in there that I think are wonderful. Um, and I was really, I've always heard, I'm not a, a scholar, I've not done more than a bachelor's in English, but I've I've always heard that William Blake had really complex feelings about Paradise Lost and Milton because of his views of innocence. And I'm a high school teacher, so I've taught a little bit of Blake and I've done songs of innocence and of experience. And I was really just shocked at, um, yeah, just at some of the sentiments that Eve expressed and how from a different, a slightly different framework of looking at the world and looking at human autonomy, they were lovely sentiments and lovely statements, right? But within the context, it was so jarring to see them situated so uh, wretchedly, right? So yeah. that was my favorite moment because maybe the complexity there, I really yeah. enjoyed it. Nick, that's brilliant. Can we go to that passage? Would you mind um, giving us the line number? Because that's like a wonderful place to start. Um, it's, well, I'll I'll let you um I'll let you find it, but experience, right? We can start with experience. Yeah, and that's where I was. Eight oh seven, isn't it? Yeah. So if we look at this um, sequence of lines, this is, and I think you are absolutely right, Nick, in pinpointing that this is right after the world falls, right? She falls, and the world falls with her. Eve. Eve, Adam was smart to get me talking about Eve, right? Eve, the bane of the world's existence. Eve, I'm sorry, pardon my French, I grew up in Jersey, but Eve, that bitch who ate the fruit and damned us all forever, right, to death and to hell. And here, 
we have Eve expressing, as you noted, I think very rightly, this kind of sense of agency or autonomy, right? And there is this awareness on her part of both her appearance and also hmm, this grasping for equality on her part, right? But this is the first time in the epic that she has desired any sense of equality or feeling equal. Now, placed in this larger framework um, of what it means to have autonomy or freedom or free will, uh, what it means to be equal to others, liberty, right? Liberty is something that Miltonists are always grappling with in Milton's work, in Paradise Lost. What does it mean to have liberty? And we, as Miltonists, right, as scholars, we're always like, oh, Milton is like the, the first uh, kind of guy who articulates liberty in this way that's kind of then caught up by the founding fathers of the U.S. even, right? It ends up um, kind of trickling into our government's documents, right? Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And here is Eve voicing a variation on that theme, right? I just want to have these basic human rights, these natural rights. And these are the rights that she frames. Now, just as a reminder, as Nick just reminded us, this is only after she's fallen. And if you do a word search for liberty in Paradise Lost, you'll see that actually it's never found in Paradise. It's never found in Eden. It's generally spoken by Satan and his demonic host. It's spoken of in the abstract by the angels. Um, so Raphael talks about liberty. But liberty is not something that really structures the social contract of, um, of Eden before the fall. Now, is there a social contract? Well, there certainly seems to be, right? So, um, so for example, when Satan first shows up in the form of this serpent, um, Eve doesn't even pay attention. Why? Because she hears so many animals rustling in the underbrush all the time. And so there is this big kind of society which stretches beyond the human, right? So we have animals rustling all over the place. We have these agential plants. Um, and how do we know that these plants are agents in their own right? Well, in the morning, in book nine, the plants wake up and they send their fragrance up to God's nostrils. And God smells the fragrance and is happy because he accepts it as a prayer, right? So we know that there are all kinds of actors in this little paradisiacal social contract. But here, here we have Eve individuating herself for the first time, right? So it's no longer about um, seeing, hmm, seeing the place as a totality, as an ecosystem even right? This kind of uh, sense of communitarian life that Eve really is and has been over these former books has been literally cultivating, tending, right? Winding weeds around one another, uh, making sure that no plant is fallen. Eve is the fairest unsupported flower at the moment before she falls. But up until that point, she has been the master gardener. And in fact, um, not just the master gardener, but also somewhat of an alchemist. If you think back to the um, books in which Adam and Raphael were having that conversation, Eve, we know, goes into her laboratory and starts crushing the fruit and making liqueurs and and really working as this almost like early modern proto-scientist, right? And then when she shows up with all of these concoctions, oh, and 
you know, I could get all scholarly and um, make you go back to where Raphael first shows up. Um, and as he comes down, he wears the markings of an alchemist, of an early modern alchemist, right? Um, including like the zodiac across his belt. Anyway, so so here she is, right? She is growing these plants. She's tending them. She's cultivating. She is wrestling along with the animals. She is then making food and great liqueur for the menfolk. And when she shows up at the table and Eve ministered, naked. We get a Hooters moment almost, right? Earlier in that sequence. So for all of Eve's agency, for all of her power to shape this collective, this pre-lapsarian collective, right? The collective before the fall, she is consistently boiled down to um, a helper, right? A lesser creature by Adam and by the angels. Now, this does not seem to phase her. Well, there is that moment at the lake, at the pond, when she's grabbed, right? She's falling in love with her image. And then she's grabbed and she turns around and she says, oh, I know I'm supposed to go with this boy, but but you know what? He's less amiably fair. He's kind of hairy and stinky. So I guess I'll go with him because I'm supposed to. So there are these minor moments. But overall, Eve is very much embedded in the social fabric of paradise, right? In the Garden of Eden. Oh, Josh. Joshua or Josh? Okay. Yeah. Joshua. Um yeah, you know, stick around. Um, I'll try to I'll try to get the jersey out, but I'm also like a first generation college kid. And I grew up in Jersey City around the block from Journal Square, which if you know it, no white people go there unless you're born there. OK, so um, just to give you a sense of like where I'm coming from and where you can be, no matter who you are and where you are where you can be with Paradise Lost. Because, you know, as Nick has just shown us, you can take this moment and then you can just expand it to look, to look at what this social contract is and does for Eve. And why equality? Why equality now, only after she eats the fruit, when it seems to be almost a sleight of hand that she's preparing for Adam, right? Because then she'll go to Adam and say, oh, don't worry, don't worry. Now we could be equal, but weren't they already? In fact, when Satan shows up in the garden before he becomes a serpent, he says, why the heck would God make these men of clay and put them above the angels, right? So they were already more than equal. So we know that this equality seems to be a bit of like a cup game, right? Um, so how do we kind of bring it back? How do we how do we zoom it out? Because this is something that I have been thinking with for a long time. Why is liberty a bad thing? Why is it a fallen thing to want to be equal, right? Why is it a sign of being damned with sin? Um, to be an individual. And Milton has given us this model for thinking through Satan over and over and over again throughout the epic, right? So Satan is an individual. He is amazing. He's wonderful to read. I kind of think of Satan as analogous to, does anyone read St. Augustine anymore? The Confessions? Joshua, okay, good. Right. So it's like the first few books of the confessions, which is all like sex, drugs and rock and roll before Augustine's then like, but then I, I became truly Christian. And from here on out, let me talk to you about the fourfold interpretation. Right. Um, all right, Joshua, I want to call on you since you're now in it. You're here. No, that was a brilliant segue. I wanted to ask you uh, about the rhetorical way in which Satan speaks and ends up sort of uh, convincing Eve to partake of this. 
this fruit. And in a sense, when you talked about how Eve would speak to Adam, doesn't she sort of take on that? Um, can you hear me well? It tells me I'm I'm talking low on my thing. Can no, you guys? Okay. No, uh, she takes on that sort of rhetorical language and persuades Adam as well. But the question you had about liberty and honor, and this is something that we've been discussing throughout the entire course, which is this notion of of how Milton is sort of obsessed with hierarchy, and uh, this this idea that liberty is connected to damnation and being fallen seems to be it seems to contrast because in many times when people will say oh Milton Satan is uh Milton in a sense and then we read Abdul and we're like oh no really Milton is kind of Abdul and then we you know we're all kind of going in different directions as to whether he's advocating for this strict religious obedience and this adherence to structure or whether he's asking for rebellion and knowing all his relation with the, the monarchy etc cetera, etc cetera. you know it's 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 more complex. I don't know what I wanted to to ask you about that. What your thoughts were on? Yeah. And anyone? Else? Okay. Um, yeah. So this is one seg into this for me, right? It's a vector into Book Nine. It's a vector into Paradise Lost. Thinking about liberty, because liberty is this abstracted. I would say it's one of the most universalized concepts at this point um, in our everyday lexicon. But back in Milton's time, and let's get back to Milton's time, because it's really, I think, um, easy to ascribe to Milton some kind of agenda um, that he wants us to then follow. But of course, for Milton, maybe not of course, but for me, after having read this for decades, over and over and over again, taught a lot. Um, but at this point, you know, Milton is nothing if not slippery about everything, right? So we can ascribe to Milton this or that or the other thing, but but it's not really fair to us. And so long ago, you've probably, Adam has probably mentioned this, Stanley Fish wrote this wonderful book called Surprised by Sin. And, you know, at first blush on Paradise Lost, and at first blush, you might think, well, it's Eve or, or maybe Adam who have been surprised by sin, maybe the serpent. But no, for Fish, it's the reader. It's you and it's me. And so as we're going through and we're reading through the first couple of books and we're suddenly saying, wait, better to reign in hell than serve in heaven? Yes, I'm here for this, right? That's that moment of being surprised by sin. We're all in it. We're fallen. We're already fallen and we're always falling. And fallenness here is something that is active and dynamic throughout the epic. We see Abdiel fall and we see him rise, right? We see the serpent fall and literally rise. And that aesthetic way that the serpent rises, right? It's a false rise. Um, but we absolutely are always on this kind of, not a roller coaster, but but there is something to it. So what is it about liberty? All right, I'm going to give you one kind of way into thinking about liberty and thinking about Milton um, and Milton's experience of it. And then I'd like to go to Julia, unless you wanna jump in right now. What do you think, Julia? Are you like, no, I wanna say something. No, you can go and then I'll, it's, it's just yeah. a question. All right. Yeah. So. So Milton at this point, um, so this book, by the time this book comes out, and you know that Milton is the first professional author, right? So he got paid um, for this manuscript, for this epic, and he got paid the princely sum of five pounds by Matthew Simmons. Um, so he had been working with this printing family for a long time for literally a, like 20 years at this point. So the son of the original printer was the man who gave him this contract and, and it, he really got like the first author contract. Now, how did he um, get in touch with this family? He lived down the street from this family. He lived on Bread Street. 
Now, what is Bradstreet? It's in the center of London. It's at the heart of, in Milton's time, the printmaking industry. Milton was like a good kind of up middle to upper middle class guy. Not the son of any kind of gentry, right? He didn't come from like a highborn. His father was actually um, a tax collector. And his first commission, Milton, was um, by his dad's friend, Henry Lowes, who was a music master. So he would write music for entertainments. And that's how Milton started getting um, his career uh, off as a writer, right? So cut to much later. At this point, Milton sells his, his, um, his epic. He has gone blind almost 20 years prior, right? So he went almost fully blind by 1651. So by the time he's selling this, he is disabled for a long time, but he's walking down the street, right? And we know this because the second edition that comes out comes out with the argument, right? So Simmons comes out with the first edition. People are like, why isn't this rhyming? What is this thing? This is weird. And so Simmons walks to Milton and he's like, Milton, why isn't this rhyming? And Milton says, because it's more heroic. It's more English that way, right? So we know that there is a lot and that's the argument of the book that we have right at the very beginning. Um, so we know once we think about putting Milton on the street, on Bread Street, in the heart of the bookmaking industry, about, I would say a quarter mile from St. Paul's, which if you've been to London, you know, it's right in the center of London. Now the Paul's, you know, is not the Paul's that Milton would have known because that Paul's was burnt in the great fire of London, 1666, and then built later, rebuilt later by Christopher Wren, who was like this really, you know, well-known architect. But in Milton's day, Paul's, the churchyard, was also one of the biggest marketplaces in the city. And so you'd go there and you would buy your strawberries, your needles, your um, pamphlets, your, your cheap prints, kind of like Milton's book, which was printed in about, oh my gosh, look at my book. This is one of three versions. Um, it was printed in about this size and people could buy it on the street. And so you'd get that right at this Paul's churchyard. Um, you'd also get the fire and brimstone preacher in the corner. You'd get a hanging if you were lucky, um, because that was also entertainment right at Paul's. Um, and right north of Paul's was one of London's liberties. So liberty the liberties of London were territories both within and outside the city. And these liberties all had their own character. Now they came into being in London, these little mini neighborhoods, because they used to be owned by religious, um, by the Roman Catholic church, basically, right? So it was land that was granted to the Roman Catholic church. And then when Catholicism was ejected during the reformation, these liberties retained some of their rights. They were sanctuaries. And so you could walk into the liberty and escape the law. They were, they, they made their own rules, some of them. Now, these liberties were kind of uneven in what rules they made and could hold and could do. But one of the biggest liberties was right north of Paul's, so right near Milton's house, and it was called St. Michael Le Grand. And that was the liberty in which all the immigrants uh, lived. Why? Because they were allowed to sell and buy. They were allowed to just live. They were allowed to buy property there in a way that they weren't throughout the rest of London. And they didn't have to pay heavy fines for selling at public marketplaces. So that's one way of thinking about liberty, right? Now, does that mean that Milton is, would be a champion of naturalization today? I can't presume to know. But I do know that Milton's everyday experience of liberty is vastly different from anything we could ever understand by just thinking about it in the abstract.
right? So I don't know if that starts to answer the question, Joshua, but that's one entry point in. And so, you know, I will actually turn to Julia now, and then I will talk to you about what these streets looked like and who may have been on them or who definitely was on them, because I have, as I've said, become really interested over the past several years in what and whom and how the blind Milton experienced his landscape, not least, and I'll give you a little spoiler for this, because if you remember, Satan, of course, turns into the serpent, but at a really evocative point, right before he approaches Eve, he also turns into a city dweller who smells the sewage coming up from the Thames and then suddenly is transported into a countryside where he sees the flowers, right? It's right around the point where he stands stupidly good, looking at Eve surrounded by these fragrant fragrant roses and the myrtle and the flowers that she is tending. But more on that in a moment, right? Let's think about what this experience really was and who Eve is as she experiences, right? To go back to Nick's uh, first observation, experience. Now she has it. What is Eve's experience and what has she become experienced in? All right, Julia. Thank you. Um, I wanted to ask you something I kind of been asking myself. Um, do you think those minor moments, as you mentioned before, such as Eve looking at herself in the pool, um, are a suggestion that there was never an absolutely unfallen state before the fall? Like, because these, I was also very intrigued, Nick, by Eve's desire for um, equality. And to me, I think this is the major reason for the fall, but I wouldn't call it ambition. I, I'm more sympathetic than that, but we can talk about that later. But that was my question. Yeah, um, that's such a, can you, re, can you restate that question? It's such a wonderful question. I wanna make sure I really address it. Um, such moments such as Eve looking at herself in the mirror, which we could, some people could interpret it as some sort of narcissism, um, her desire to like wander off alone without Adam, all of those, those little things could be interpreted in a negative light in, and could like suggest an unfallen an unfallenness on her before she eats the apple. So I was like thinking of things that we talked before of her as a garden that needs to be tended of her as someone that needs to be swayed and convinced to like be dominated by Adam and all of those things. So I was wondering if there was ever a completely unfallen state before the actual fall, you know? Such a great question, because we're met with fallenness, right? The very first moment of the epic, we they've just fallen and fallen and fallen and fallen. Now they're chained on the burning lake. Oh, God, right? So we have nothing but fallenness. And even in the argument at the beginning of book nine, um, so, you know, that prose section, um, Eve, Milton explains to us, is desirous of uh, to make trial of her strength, make trial of her strength. Now, this doesn't seem to be an Eve who doesn't care about kind of winning, <laughs> right? Rather, actually, this make trial of her strength um, invokes or anticipates his later work, Milton's uh, uh, Samson Agonistes, which is published together with Paradise Regained. Right. So this is a companion piece to Paradise Lost. He publishes it uh, just a couple of years later. And Paradise Regained is a very short book, um, a, a mini epic. 
And then it's followed by Samson Agonistes, Samson from Judges, who you know by his hair, and Dalila. We don't call her Delilah as Milton is. We have to say Dalila because we're pretentious and different. I don't know why. But, right, so here... Eve is kind of almost like this Old Testament hero, right? She's going to pr uh, prove this like trial of her strength. Now, there are, Miltonists are generally of one mind. There is an unfallen paradise and it is utterly ruined and it's all tragedy after Eve, again, that damn woman, right, eats the fruit. Um, but Milton, as you've probably noticed over and over again, really delves pretty deeply into doctrinal ambiguity, right? And so a lot of scholars have said, well, he's, um, he's heterodox, right? He's not heretical. He's just a bit off in the way he's thinking through these things. So, you know, is he, um, participating in, well, I'm sure Adam has told you about like um, the millenarian movements, right? Uh, like the end of days, apocalyptic movements that are happening in like mid-century London and in England. Um, and so we have a lot of this kind of mushiness. Um, Felix Culpa is one of these kind of mushy doctrinal points, right? So the fortunate fall or the happy fall, it's such a paradox. Um, but I think we can see it throughout. And so fallenness itself is ambiguous too, over and over and over again, both before and after the fall. We're fallen. We're fallen readers. We're coming into this fallen text. We're trying to understand, understand the ways of God. We're trying to open up this book of nature and read through it the book of God, right? And what do I mean the book of nature, book of God? I mean, this is the foundations of like um, modern science as well, the 17th century, right? So at the beginning of the century, we have Francis Bacon, You've probably heard of him. And Francis Bacon says, hey, why are we reading ancient works without, um, and just kind of like credulously believing in them? Why are we not experimenting and observing and being in the world, right? So he is encouraging people, and this is an oversimplification, right? Because both were happening always, but um, he's encouraging people to move away from a deductive method, right? Learning from books, learning from the past, and being credulous in that way, and moving towards induction, which is happening through observation and experiment. So Eve's in the middle of all of this, all of it, because before the fall, as I just mentioned, she has this laboratory, and she is experimenting, right? She is working with the materials that she is given, the materials of the book of nature, which people like Francis Bacon and other early modern naturalists all said were the legible text of the book of God, if you only knew how to read them carefully enough, right? So is Eve fallen ahead of time because she's already kind of not trusting in tradition, not trusting in the messages given by Raphael? by Adam, and by the voice of God at the lake, Eve, Eve, come hang out with this hairy dude, right? Um, so we see throughout that there's a slight recalcitrance in Eve. Um, it, it prevents her from fully participating in this kind of prelapsarian way of thinking about things. Then again, and spoiler alert, you'll see after this book, Eve does function as some pretty heavy duty social glue. So as everything is falling apart, Eve comes in and says, okay, I know what we have to do. I know what's gonna happen now, right? So she is at once individuated and experimenting and doing all of, all of these things that she's not supposed to be doing before the fall. 
And then she's also building community and crying over her flowers that she has to leave because they're like her babies, right? And really kind of um, incorporating the pre-lapsarian lessons after the fall. And I think for Melton, it's mushy. And I think it's in part because like Paul, he believes we see through a glass darkly. And so he can compare great things to small. He can um, kind of show analogies, right? He can describe, and there are these wonderful descriptions all throughout the epic of, oh, well, you know, this tree is not like this tree or this tree or this tree or this tree. It's more like this tree that was in Hesperus, right, at this point of time. So we learn a lot by proximity, by analogy, by um, reading, by trying to make legible. And so is Eve. Does that make her a hero? No. Does it make her the devil that medieval monks really desperately wanted her to be? Probably not. You know, they should have probably gotten over that a long time ago. But um, but here we are with this curse of Eve. And so that's another thing that Milton's really grappling with. And let me complicate it with a different vector. So Milton has gone blind, right, at this point. He's dictating, you probably know this, the entirety of the epic to his daughters and his nephew, right, the Manuenses. So he's already dependent on others. He's reliant on women and young people. Now, he's also dependent on a medical system that has been broken for a long time. The first time it broke was under Henry VIII, because when Henry VIII kicked uh, Roman Catholicism out of England, he also kicked out all of the hospitals. They were all run by nuns. So the first healthcare crisis that happened in England led to Henry VIII establishing this law saying any woman who has any power over plants, over working with medicinal plants, has to help build this community, has to help cure the commonalty, right? So then Milton is going blind, also losing his wives, his children, right, um, in a time of a sustained medical crisis, a healthcare crisis, because we are in a civil war at this point, right? England has beheaded its king, and then all of the doctors are at the fronts. Now, we've also gotten a recently monopolized medical industry, because at the beginning of the 17th century, right around the same time as Francis Bacon, the English crown decided to put a rubber stamp on university trained physicians and say, these are the only doctors who could really be called real doctors. And then the doctors get into cahoots with the Society of Apothecaries, right? And the apothecaries are the only ones who are allowed to create the medicines for these doctors. Now, there is a book that is printed for these apothecaries by the doctors, by the Royal College of Physicians, it's called. And um, this book is in Latin. So that way, normal people don't know how to read it. Not especially the people who need healthcare, which is increasingly scarce and expensive. So right around the time that Milton is suffering through all of these ailments, oh, he's also terrible. He's got a terrible stomach. So that's why there's so much flatulence in the epic. Like he had a lot of problems, digestive problems. No, it's true. Like, like this is how he's thinking through, right? So, all right. So here's the vector, right? All of a sudden we have an Eve who has expertise in medicine or in plants and how to make them into certain recipes we have an Eve who seems to be um, administer ministering, literally ministering, right? So she's doing this kind of like care work for Adam, for Raphael when he shows up, for the plants most certainly. And we also have, um, and I kind of published this a while back, we have an Eve and 
plants and flowers and her working with all these things um, kind of cribbed, plagiarized uh, directly out of recipe books. Now, I told you the Royal College of Physicians made this big Latin, right, uh, London dispensatory. Well, when Milton started writing this book or dictating it, um, a guy named Nicholas Culpepper came out with an English translation. It was a renegade translation of this Latin apothecary manual. And Culpepper says, I am putting this out because those damn doctors shouldn't have a medical monopoly. You should all be able to know how to go out and find your own like uh, weeds, literally pick them and make them into medicines. And so I'm going to sell this book for a couple of pennies. So that way anyone could have it. He put it into probably, oh, I don't even have anything that small, like something like this. Like this size, it later became printed in like this size. It was like a little pocketbook and you bought it at Paul's. And Eve is taking care of and plucking and manipulating all the plants that are found in these recipe books. Okay, so who is plucking these plants? Who's selling them on the streets of London on Bread Street right near where Milton is living and working and suffering from a, a number of ailments. At a time when um, a historian of medicine, Mary Fissell, says that almost everyone in England was brought into the world by a woman and brought back out by a woman. And in between, women did all of the care work, right? So so Eve is, is there. Eve definitely resonates with that. But she also resonates with a more lowly group of women, herb women, herb women, they're called. They are of the poorest sort. They were illiterate. No one knows anything about herb women because they left no records other than when they were dragged into court by apothecaries and accused of being vagrants, witches, or criminals who were stealing apothecaries business. They would go out and they would forage the weeds right outside of the city walls. They would put them in their baskets and they would bring them back and sell them on Bread Street, sell them at Paul's, sell them at major marketplaces. Now, even though we don't have official historical records of these women, we know that they were everywhere. How? Because one of the most popular ballads of the time that was printed over and over again, you know, like the stuff you sing, um, is called The Cries of London. London was internationally renowned for the, the um, shouts of its street vendors selling stuff. And these shouts in the ballad, The Cries of London, are all by herb women. Buy my ivy, buy my myrtle, buy my mugwort, buy my rose petals, buy my... And it's a list of everything that comes up in book nine. So who is Eve? Who is Eve? We can abstract Eve and we could say, oh, Eve, the first mother. And, you know, women, we're all daughters of Eve, right? In this abstracted sense. And she craves liberty. She craves equality. And we can abstract those too. But ultimately, let's think about what it means to be Milton. And you're walking along Bread Street and you're guided most likely by the hand of your caregiver, right? By your daughter or your nephew, maybe a neighbor. And you're buying these herbs, these little weeds, right? Or maybe your daughter is to make recipes, right? Make little medicinal recipes for your upset stomach. This is before the time of like Alka-Seltzer. And you are smelling everything and you are hearing everything and you are sensing everything. And that is what I have turned to more and more in my own work, right? Because at this critical moment, remember, Satan says, well, look at me. Just look. Don't you believe me? Right? Your eyes will not lie. But we already know that Eve's eyes have lied, right? That vision, you can't depend on it. You can't depend on sight alone. 
sight can mislead you. And it does, it misleads Eve. And so how do we find a richer index of experience? Because he does, Milton does put us in paradise along with God and his nostrils, which is also biblical. He doesn't make up God's nostrils, right? Okay. Um, so, you know, God is smelling these plants and so should we. And Eve is looking at the snake who's saying, just me, look at me. And we know we shouldn't, right? And we hear, we hear the sounds of rustling. Milton puts us in there and we smell the sewage coming up from the Thames along with Satan, right? So Milton puts us in there. We're all tempted. We're all challenged to experiment, to observe, to experience, to experience this fall over and over and over again, right? This is the moment. Is it a happy, happy thing? Earth groaned and felt the wound. It is tragic. Does it lend us our experience? It is fortunate, right? And Eve, for what it's worth, um, in the kind of biblical or Renaissance commonplace, with the ejection of the first parents from the garden, um, Renaissance people, scientists included, like Francis Bacon, believed that when the first parents were ejected, then all of the plants were also scattered throughout the earth as their help meet, as their medicine, and as proof that God so loves the world, as proof of divine providence. And so they are the botanical matter, right, of like this kind of proof because they are medicines and they are also agents in their own right. You can and they can worship God as well as humanity. So it's a weird thing to think of, right? But putting Milton on the ground like that allows us to think through the ways in which people experienced not just the world, but also cosmology, right? How they thought of life itself. What does it mean to exist? And before we have liberty as abstracted, before we have Descartes, who says, I think, therefore I am, we had a very different way of looking at the way life was entwined, right? Literally entangled. Um, and that's why when Eve says, we have too much work in book nine, Adam says, all we have to do is clear out little cat tracks. We don't have to be totally separate. We just do the work we need to do. And we recognize, right, our place and the kind of ecology of paradise. And so as we're thinking about how to tend to ourselves, each other, how to build communities, how to fashion like an ecosystem, literally like a system of care, how to care for our landscape, how to care for the life forms in it. I think Milton could teach us a lot about how limiting our own kind of basic assumptions are about how separated we are, about how alienated we are from each other, from ourselves, from our world, right? This is why I put Milton on the streets over and over. This is why I see Eve as a herb woman or a midwife or a witch, because herb women were also accused of being witches. So was Nicholas Culpepper. And if you are curious about Nicholas Culpepper, his books were printed hundreds of times over the ensuing centuries. And if you walk into a hippie bookstore today, like one that sells herbs in jars, you'll still find Culpepper's herbal. Culpepper had the first two medical books printed in the American colonies in Boston, where you are, by, I think, Daniel Boone? Nicholas Boone, I think. Um, all right, with that, I could go on. You could probably tell I could go on, but I wanna hear. I wanted to ask, um, so I'm a climate writer and, and ecology is something that's always in front of what I read. And um, this has been really bothering me because I do um, I um, do a secular reading of Paradise Lost because I come from India. So like all the religions meld here. 
and I try to compare the philosophies. And I was always concerned about the idea of dominion versus stewardship when they are put on earth. And Milton's use of the word, like you subdue the earth or you disburden her of her birth. And, and that just didn't sit well with me because at the same time, I feel Eve is closer to stewardship than, than Adam is, who is more of dominion. And I think Milton kind of breaks the idea of hierarchy and equality between the two that way, um, giving us the contrariness. But I just wanted to know your view on these really, really strong words, you know, um, yeah. because they don't they they don't indicate a holistic view of the land per se. No, not at all. And in fact, I think it's really easy for us to um, look at Adam's conception of what it means to have dominion over the land, along with Raphael's, because Raphael is giving us the same message. Right. Michael will later, too. Um, but it's really easy for us to kind of like uh, place primacy on that. But you know what? I think you're absolutely right. Milton is actually giving us two vastly different ways of looking at this kind of ecological care, right? This um, early modern environmentalism. Now, it's important to Milton because this was also the time period what happens when you start building modern scientific communities? They start polluting everything. And so we have like this huge kind of coal mining industry um, cropping up around England. And suddenly we have terrible air pollution where all sorts of people are getting asthma and complaining. And this is all landing in these little cheap print medical books, right? So lots of people are looking for remedies to this air pollution. So Milton is also living through this, right? He's living through a time of ecological crisis. And he sees on the one hand, people increasingly saying, well, we just have to manipulate. We have to, you know, uh, kind of like extract things. And I didn't even want to touch this, but I'm just going to go there. Milton's also living in a time when England is starting to become the British Empire, right? So this is in the century leading up to the official establishment of the British Empire in 1707, right? Um, but by... So this is like 1660s, 1670s, right? This is when people, and this is when it's printed, when people are coming out. That is the precise moment when the Jamestown settlement, which was first planted by England at the beginning of the century, at the beginning of the 17th century, and it was planted by a corporation. You know this, right? So this was not a crown endeavor. This was the company, the Jamestown or Virginia company. Um, so it was also the invention of like the joint stock model of shareholding. So people bought shares in the Jamestown settlement. But by Milton's time, when this is published, that is the critical tipping point at which the Jamestown settlement moved from and definitively into, because before that, you know, you'd have indentured servants. I don't have time to get into the various like uh, categories of service or labor that are happening in the colonies, English colonies. But 1660s, 1670s, we have 90% of the tobacco in Jamestown and the surrounding area in Virginia grown by enslaved Afro-diasporic people. So... And England only brought over about 5% of the enslaved people out of Western Africa. Most of that was coming over uh, through Spain and Portugal, through this thing called the Asiento, granted by the Pope. That's a whole other narrative. But here we have Milton facing the birth of modern kind of extractive economies as well, right? And we have God, the planter, and so we have Milton's real awareness of like these plantation models of settlement that are coming in. So that's an ecological uh, mm, crisis. I will not talk about that more. That's my whole book project that I'm working on now. 
Um, and we have, so we have extractive models, we have corporate models, we have pollution, we have things coming over foreign objects and people coming over. You know that Pocahontas was a guest of James the First. She was watching plays in his court by what, 1607? Is that right? So 17, 1617, I think. So no, I think earlier. Anyway. Um, so Milton's really grappling with this environmental issue and he's saying, okay, we can extract Satan does Satan comes into the serpent and uses natural life for his own purposes. Right. Um, Adam says this at this moment, that's why I wanted to point it out. We just need little cat tracks. Right. But he too has been indoctrinated with this model of kind of extractive or dominant ways of thinking about the landscape through Raphael. I think of Raphael as a very suspect narrator. I don't love the angel Raphael, right? Um, also, he's like, oh, you know, bitches, they're like bros before hoes kind of thing, right? So, right, right. Um, so I don't trust Raphael. And then Milton's thinking, okay, like, this world is going to hell in a handbasket. And let's not forget that these end of days people are also thinking through Eden, not as something in England, right? The uh, millenarians. So they're not thinking of uh, Eden as somewhere else. They're trying to rebuild it in England. They're trying to make England the new paradise. And that's why they're bringing in all these plants extracted from the new world because they want to plant it in England and make it a universal Garden of Eden. So as he's encountering this, he's saying, this is a real powerful model. It's a, it's a dominant model. And here is the model of Eve, who forages, who tends, who cries over her plants. Her plants cry over her. There is a real depth. There is a profundity to her entanglement with the world. And it's not one that is lost in the fall, right? So can I say that Milton would have been picketing along with Greenpeace? No, I have no idea. Um, but I can say that he's always giving us multiple ways of thinking about these kind of confounding or wicked problems that they are encountering then as now. That was a long answer to a simple question. <laughs> it's a good question, though. <laughs> All right. Well, you guys know how to how to rule your Q and A. So I see Josh yeah. on the first, then Nick. But mm -hmm. okay, I'm a box Joshua out of here because you mentioned Raphael, and that's what my question is about. Um, we had a really, really, really wonderful lecture by Dr. Larson. I can't, I've been trying to remember his first name for 20 minutes and I can't remember it. Uh, but he gave us this really beautiful lecture on Monday uh, in which he mapped um, the sort of, I think it was like the structure of Plato's Republic onto the dialectic between um, Adam and Raphael in book eight. And it was just wonderful. And a bunch of us were talking after class about whether we thought there would be a inversion or negation or corrupted version of that pedagogical relationship. Because in the following book, we see Satan and Eve, as we've seen Raphael and Adam, and Satan loves those dualities. In book two, we get pandemonium. And then in book three, we get the council in heaven, which Adam pointed out to us a lot. So now that we've gotten through book nine, um, and I think Joshua had also mentioned like Satan's rhetorical manipulative nature and the rhetoric of his discourse with Eve. I'm really curious to know whether you think that there's a comparison or a contrast between uh, a kind of pedagogy and a kind of rhetoric in terms of the interactions between these expressively sort of like teaching and persuasive figures who are also giving arguments Right. And there's a lot of argumentation going on. So I'm just really curious on your thoughts on that. Yeah, um, I can lead us to a moment in book nine um, that I think really can exemplify this. Right. It's Satan's eloquence. And this is line 668. 
Um, so this is when the serpent, Eve is like, I would have believed you more if you hadn't overstated your case, right? You're like too talky a serpent. Um, so he says, ah, right, in act raised, he he rouses himself as of some great matter to begin, as when of old some orator renowned in Athens or free Rome, where eloquence flourished since mute to some great cause addressed, stood in himself collected. Well, each part, motion, each act, one audience, ear the tongue. Sometimes in height began as no delay of preface, brooking through his zeal of right. So before he speaks, he establishes his ethos and it is irreproachable, right? So his eloquence is epic. He is a classic, right, kind of Roman um, or we can bring it back to the Republic, sure. But this feels very kind of Ciceronian to me, right? Like he establishes his authority before he ever opens his mouth. That is a mode. Now, is there another mode? Not words alone pleased her. When Adam talks to Eve, they cuddle. She prefers, not because she can't understand without it, but she prefers to have that kind of um, those lessons taught with love. So what is love? Well, it's not something Milton can define here, but we know that Adam knows full well in the argument of book nine. We know that Adam knows full well what Eve is tempting him with, and he chooses to eat the fruit out of love. And Love becomes more and more potent over the course of the next few books. So as you're reading through, see how love disrupts and is illogical and honestly kind of messes up these neat um, pairings and hierarchies, right? That Milton never seems to believe in anyway. I mean, if you think of, yeah, pandemonium and heaven, and you think about how the same architect who built heaven built pandemonium. Yeah, what are we supposed to make of these weird moments, right? And so this dialectic is essential to classical rhetoric, right? And Satan is nothing if not a rhetorician. Um, but I think Milton moves us away, moves us away from, from the kind of sophisticated lexicon um, with which the devils argue in pandemonium, right? They love it. They were like philosophers and, and now they could keep being philosophers. That form of mental masturbation is so wonderful. I know it. I went into the ivory tower decades ago and I never came out, right? For that reason. But there's something more powerful and it's something that you cannot say. And it's something that cannot be explained. And it's something to do with creaturely touch and sense and motion and that dynamism that comes outside of, la of language, right? And it comes within these loving relations. So Adam and Eve are a microcosm, are an example of this kind of loving relation, but so is Eve's love for her flowers. I mean, she cries, she's heartbroken when she leaves not because she's leaving Eden, but because she's leaving her plants. Right? It's different. So I don't know if that answers your question. <laughs> okay. Joshua, you have the, the honored position as the last questioner. So no pressure. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'm so glad you mentioned Cicero because writing that line, I wrote, I wrote Cicero thinking of him given his Philippics and, you know, that sort of stance he would give. But I want to ask you about uh, the notion of reason. There are many words that come to mind when reading this book. We have pride and all that, so many words. But reason is sort of an adjective or something that's always associated with Adam in the book. When I read over, I, I think of the things that I talked about, the adjectives that I used to describe Eve. It's her virginity or majesty, beauty. I, mean, I just even go back to book eight. And when Adam says so beautifully, he says, grace was all in her steps heaven in her eye, in every gesture, dignity and love, I overjoyed and so on and so forth. And it talks about, you know, her beauty, her virginity, her essence, but reason is not 
always mentioned alongside these until, uh, you know, I, I, I thought that. I thought that. I'm, and I still feel that to a sense. But this line here uh, in Book 9, uh, 653, uh, 653 or 652, rather, God so commanded, and, and she's, this is Eve speaking, God so commanded and left that command, so daughter of his voice, the rest we live, law to ourselves, our reason is our law. And she says that to Satan in the opposition. And I, I don't know, I was thinking about the beauty of the book and the history of the book is that when, where you find an argument for something, you can also find an argument in opposition to it. It's the, like you said, the profundity and the richness of the, of the work itself. But I feel that a lot of things that are stressed about Eve, it's not necessarily, it's not reason. Even though that line there is very stark and, and it, it advocates for it in a sense, it's other things. It's like you say, uh, the stewardship, her kindness and all these things. But that, I don't know, what do you um, think about that? Um, I love this. I I could talk to you about this all day. Okay. Um, yes, I think you're right. I think that um Milton seems to very deliberately not withhold reason from his representation of Eve, but make reason circum circumscribed within very kind of standard models, strict models that you can call even Ciceronian, right? But they are, or scholastic, right? For the medievalists in the bunch, um, because they're always kind of posed on this um, rigorous logical structure, right? Yes, no, synthesis, right? That's even like Ramus with his um, simplification of rhetoric. Uh, again, Milton wrote a rhetoric handbook you know this right like he wrote a manual okay um for students so rhetoric and reason go together and it is a performance and it's performed over and over again most admirably by satan but also by raphael and other angels um Adam, not so much. He likes to kind of take the dumb blonde approach to it all. He's like, oh, tell me more, Angel. I love this so much. I'm just eating it all up. Uh, but we also have, so I just pointed out Satan's eloquence in book nine. But then remember that moment when he first sees Eve and he stands stupidly good, silent immobile, motionless. He's like stopped dead in his tracks. He forgets his agenda. He forgets himself. Stupidly good, Satan. And so reason is effective, right? It's effective in this kind of militaristic or antagonistic, you might even call it a Hegelian sense of interpersonal relations, right? Hegel, that master-servant dialectic, so everything is antagonistic for Hegel, right? Every time you see another person, you're trying to get one over, you're gotten one over on. Um, so that is really effective. But what's more effective? What cannot be reasoned out, but which has its own reason. And that's where we see kind of the book of God emerge at moments like that, at moments that you just read, because it's not keyed to satanic eloquence. Reason is our law, but what she refers to seems to be very different from how reason has been batted about by all the men folk throughout, right? So again, do I have a firm answer? No, no. I do believe that Milton, who knew many languages, I mean, you know, he was the secretary of foreign tongues under Cromwell's government, right? Um, Milton knew many languages. He is the most eloquent, but throughout his epic, he encourages these moments of silence, these moments that exceed language. And it's in those moments that we see hints of the divine, this unmediated divine, because Milton was a Protestant. Like, yeah, he was open-minded, but he really hated Catholics. Like, we know this, right? Um, but it's that, that, right? Um, that kind of silence and that kind of peace. And you'll see it again, right? You'll see it again at the end. Because, oh, can I just say it? So after multiple books of lessons where Michael is like, 
This is what you must know, Adam. I am knocking Eve out with some kind of like roofie or something. So she's going to be passed out. And I'm just going to teach you because it's just the boys here, right? Locker room talk now about the future. Um, so then Adam goes back to Eve and he wakes her up and he's like, Eve, I got to tell you all this really cool shit that Michael just told me. And Eve says, I already know. Take my hand. Let's go. So is it women's intuition? We can, you know, kind of, yeah, um, do it a disservice by calling it that. But there is some kind of reason operating uh, that subtends the kind of spectacularity of rational discourse that is keyed to the satanic or at the very least the misguided. So where that other reason lies, only you know, because it's unmediated. I can't tell you. There is no intercessor for you. Right? That is Miltonic. Milton says... The world is all before you. And, you know, your guide is yourself. So you wander your own way through the world. You figure it out. And that's the most beautiful part of Paradise Lost for me. That's what keeps me coming back and loving reading it. I reread book nine. I've memorized it, but I reread it before this because I just love it. Anyway, I'll stop there. Thank you for that wonderful question. Thank wow. you. Thank you so much, Dr. Lecky. Um, this was absolutely so informative and scintillating. We're going to stop the recording here, but just wanted to say thanks so much for that engaging lecture and conversation on this. Love the idea of this unabstracted Eve um, and the way you brought in this historical biographical context, which just really threw light on the passages in book nine and also on Eve's character. I love that term, index of experience. I think I'm going to try to take that take that with me. So thank you so much. Again, what a gift. And for everyone on the ALP YouTube, thanks for watching. Thank you for inviting me, Adam. I really appreciated it. I love this kind of work.